to targeted therapy, systemic therapy, and biomarkers to guide the treatment decisions. It gives me immense pleasure to th thank Dr. Gridhar Bankadesh and Dr. Vishal Ratkal for accepting our invitation as speakers. I welcome you, sir, on our platform. Moving towards the uh, introduction of our first speaker, Dr. Gridhar Bankadesh, who is an head of department urology, enology, and renal transplant at Kaveri Hospital, Bangalore. Dr. Uh, Gethar has completed his MBBS from Bangalore Medical College and went on to do his MS in general surgery from the prestigious Ames Institute, New Delhi. He later completed his MCH in urology from Kasturba Medical College, Manipal. Sir has over 10 years of experience in urology and is well versed with most of the urological surgeries. He has kept himself abreast with the latest developments in the field of urology and has added advanced skills to his urological reputation. He has acquired additional training in laparoscopic urology and is specialized in endourological management of kidney stone diseases. He, has, he is an active member of Urological Society of India and has many publications to his credit. I welcome you, sir, on our platform. Our next speaker is Dr. Vishal Rutkal, who is a urologist, uh, endrologist from Bangalore. Sir has over 17 years of experience in the field. He has, uh, he has completed MCH urology from Kasturba Medical College, MS General Surgery from uh, Mysore Medical College, and uh, graduation from uh, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru Medical College. He is a member of Urological Society of India. Some of the services that are being provided by Dr. Vishal uh, Ratkala, kidney stone treatments, circumcision, uh, urinary tract obstructions, and many other uh, recent advances towards the procedures and treatment of prostate cancer. We welcome you, sir. As I read the structure of webinar, you could see that we have launched three poll. I'll request all the participants to kindly submit their polls. After the welcome note, uh, I would hand over the platform to Dr. Gerdar Venkatesh, who would be taking up the first speaker session on targeted therapy and systemic therapy for management of high-risk prostate cancer. After him, uh, our, uh, our second speaker for today would discuss his views on the role of uh, biomarkers in treatment and management. Uh, after both these speaker sessions, we would have a Q&A session and a vote of thanks would be delivered. I'll request all the participants to kindly stay with us till the second poll. The general instructions of this webinar are, all the participants will be muted during the webinar. If you have any queries, please type in Q&A section. If you have any comments, please type in chat section. Queries and questions will be addressed at the end of webinar by the moderator. This session will be recorded and the recording would be shared via email notifications once the recorder is available. Polls will be raised at the start as well as at the end of the session. We request all the participants to kindly provide with their feedback. With this, I'll stop sharing my screen and hand over the stage to Dr. Kit. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction, Dr. Shubhi, and uh, good evening uh, to all the uh, participants. Uh, well, uh, I think <laughs> uh, this, the topic that we are about to discuss today is uh, uh, one of the most difficult uh, topics in uh, urology. Uh, this is about targeted and systemic therapy in advanced prostate cancer. So, uh, if, you, if you just type this uh, uh, in Google for a quick search, you will get thousands uh, in fact, you'll get more than 20,000 articles on this particular topic. So you can see there has been an ocean of literature on this particular uh, uh, topic, uh, research topic, especially prostate cancer related research is undergoing a paradigm change in the recent years. And why not? Uh, because prostate cancer is the most common malignancy and uh, the second leading cause of cancer-related death among uh, men, especially in the Western world. And uh, uh, when, when we talk about high-risk uh, prostate cancer, the question comes uh, about risk stratification because who, which patient or which subgroup of patients can be classified under high-risk uh, prostate cancer uh, group. So according to NCCN and EAU guidelines, uh, the Prostate cancer can be 
classified into three risk groups, the low risk, intermediate and high risk groups. Uh, a PSA of less than 10, Gleason score of less than 7 and clinical stage P1 to 2A are classified under low risk uh, uh, group. So you can see PSA Gleason score are extremely important for this classification. So intermediate uh, group uh, contains uh, subjects with PSA between 10 and 20 and a Gleason score of 7. And uh, PSA above 20, a Gleason score of uh, more than 7 and uh, clinical stage of upwards T3A are put into the high risk category group. So what are the therapeutic options available for treatment of these uh, uh, particular uh, groups of patients? So they can be further sub, uh, classified into hormone naive and castrate resistant prostate cancer groups. And there are several treatment options available for uh, management of these patients. The most common among them are uh, androgen deprivation therapy, ADT, chemotherapeutic agents, docetaxel, cabazitaxel, immunotherapeutic agents like uh, uh, cipulucel, pembrolizumab. There are so many, a myriad of other uh, agents available. I'll be going to discuss a uh, few of them in my talk. Novel androgen receptors, uh, including aviratron and enzalutamide, uh, which are the most commonly used uh, agents. Then bone targeting, alpha emitting radionuclide uh, ligand uh, therapies and radium-223 uh, therapy. And of course, I should be mentioning here that radiotherapy forms an important part of management of locally advanced prostate cancer, especially high-risk disease and post-radical prostatectomy positive margin status. Uh, going deeper into each subcategories, the hormone naive prostate cancer has few therapeutic uh, approaches and these the most common among them are a combination of ADT and the neohormonal agents, uh, mainly abiraterone or enzalutamide. Uh, along with chemotherapy with docetaxel can be considered. In fact, uh, one of the most recent studies has shown that triple therapy with the ADT, docetaxel and abiraterone or darolutamide uh, versus hormone therapy alone has shown clinically significant survival benefit uh, in the former category. Uh, coming to CRPC, the aim of uh, management, the treatment of CRPC is to improve survival and quality of life. So the CRPC can be non-metastatic or metastatic. In fact, non-metastatic CRPC poses a unique challenge because anything that we use in this category has not shown any survival benefit. So these uh, uh, patients are actually recommended or encouraged to enroll in clinical trials. And most of them are treated in a clinical trial setting. Uh, whereas metastatic CRPC has more well-established uh, treatment options. The first-line treatment uh, for uh, metastatic CRPC is docetaxel, and alternate options are abiraterone and enzalutamide. And second-line second line therapies, when the first line does not work, are cabazitaxel and immunotherapeutic agents. Uh, as I said, there are uh, plenty of them. Then PARP inhibitors, poly-ADP uh, uh, ribose phosphatase inhibitors, then PSMA radio ligand therapy, uh, which includes uh, actinium and lutetium uh, labeled PSMA uh, targeted therapy. So uh, briefly about androgen deprivation therapy, ADT was among the four, first and foremost uh, used uh, systemic therapies for advanced prostate cancer. Uh, we know that castration has been in use since the 1940s. And for nearly four to five decades, bilateral orchidectomy, which is an irreversible form of uh, uh, castration, uh, has been uh, most popular till about the mid 80s, when GnRH agonists were uh, uh, developed. So these are uh, the most commonly used are uh, luprolide or uh, luprorelin, gosarelin, and triptorelin. Uh, so these have been uh, quite popular over the last couple of decades, and they've gradually replaced. Uh, surgical castration uh, to a significant extent. And then there are gonadotrophin uh, releasing hormone antagonists. Degarelix is the most uh, popular among them. This is uh, some, somewhat used as a second line therapy. 
and there are anti androgens the first generation uh, agent bicalutamide has been commonly used with uh, castration for a long period of time and recently the second generation uh, drug enzalutamide is gaining significant popularity of course there are several uh, studies uh, I, i'll enumerate them later and uh, androgen syn synthesis inhibitors like abiraterone are also popular over the last uh, uh, a decade so uh, adt has been the first choice uh, treatment for hormone naive uh, metastatic prostate cancer and it has uh, uh, it has been shown that it provides a very favorable response in most cases with a reliable psa response for uh, 24 uh, to 36 uh, months Uh, the most commonly used treatment agents are combination of uh, a gnrh agonist with an anti androgen uh, that is the most preferred initial treatment and and uh, historically the most common used uh, commonly used agents are uh, luprolide with uh, bicalutamide for a, uh, a duration of more than two decades and it has been shown that no single agent is better than the other all are equally effective and uh, it has been shown that early hormone uh, treatment uh, delays progression of disease as well as uh, development of symptomatic uh, disease in asymptomatic uh, subjects uh, when it comes to actual administration of adt most experts prefer intermittent versus continuous uh, therapy in a, a study which was published in lancet 2000 and later also revised in 2015 the prostate cancer trialists collaborative group uh, they a like majority of the 84% of the uh, uh, experts they preferred intermittent androgen uh, uh, deprivation therapy this is because it uh, has less adverse effects and also it retains sensitivity to adt so less adverse effects mean that the quality of life is better for these patients so uh, most experts prefer intermittent adt over uh, continuous adt and of course uh, both therapies require regular psa monitoring every 3 to 6 months till cr it progresses to crpc there are some problems with uh, adt the most Uh, important among them is that it is tumoristatic and not tumoricidal so it can control the disease for a, a, a specific duration and uh, it it cannot uh, offer cure to any subset of patients and of course there are adverse effects of uh, adt either a surgical or medical castration has its own adverse effects the most common among them are enumerated here hot flashes fatigue insomnia then sexual uh, uh, related adverse effects like erectile dysfunction loss of libido development of gynecomastia and then systemic uh, side effects like bone loss anemia accelerated atherosclerosis causing uh, cardiovascular adverse effects loss of muscle mass weight gain these are some of the well documented adverse effects of uh, adt so uh, alternative therapies are being continuously researched and immunotherapy has emerged as a significant alternative uh, to uh, second line first even first line uh, therapies in uh, majority of uh, metastatic crpc uh, patients one of the important limitations of prostate cancer is that it has a very cold which is uh, an immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment as we all know tumor microenvironment has a very important role in the response to immunotherapy so uh, how how to bypass this limitation in in this uh, prostate cancer patients so one of the strategies employed is to manipulate the tumor microenvironment uh, to sensitize the tumor to immunotherapeutic agents so this has been uh, developed to a significant extent and in the in the next few uh, slides i will show you all the research that is happening so uh so as as i enumerated efficacy as of uh, immunotherapy depends on the tumor mutational burden so when the tumor mutational burden is high response to immunotherapy is expected to be good whereas the problem in prostate cancer that 
is that the TMB mutational burden is quite low. That's why it has a very cold uh, or an immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment. And uh, new antigen expression is very important for immunotherapeutic agents to work well. So uh, some of the uh, observations in these groups are higher expression of uh, PDL1 levels uh, show that there is a higher risk of biochemical recurrence or metastatic progression one. And then if there are DNA repair defects in these tumors, there is an enhanced response to immunotherapy. Whereas a lot of prostate cancers do not show these uh, DNA repair defects. So they do not respond to immunotherapy. So if we can convert the uh, tumors from not repairing the defects to those that repairing the defects, then there can be an enhancement in the response. So this picture shows uh, several agents which are targeted. Uh, these are factors which influence the immune response in advanced prostate cancer. There are several immunosuppressive factors and uh, uh, some of the immunostimulating factors. This has been published in a latest uh, study by Amsberg et al. in the International Journal of Molecular uh, Sciences. This is a very good article. I recommend uh, all people to go through that article. So the immunosuppressive factors are Treg loss of uh, MHC1, then uh, androgen deprivation therapy itself, adenosine, P10 deficiency, and those immunostimulating factors are NK cells, then microsatellite uh, instabilities, CTLs, tumor uh, mutational burden, uh, and other, other uh, factors. So based on these factors, several immunotherapeutic approaches have been developed. Uh, I've enumerated a few of them. Vaccines have been tried to combat prostate cancer. Then there are checkpoint inhibitors. These are the latest uh, uh, this thing, research agents. And then there are combination therapies involving checkpoint inhibitors and vaccines with other agents as well. There are, they have tried combination of different checkpoint inhibitors, uh, CIs with ADT, with chemotherapy, with PARP inhibitors, with radionuclide therapy, and combination of other agents among themselves like chemotherapy and PARP inhibitors. There are several ongoing trials and in uh, probably another decade, we'll have a much clearer picture about the role of immunotherapy in this advanced prostate cancer. So this uh, uh, picture shows how immunotherapeutic approaches can work in advanced prostate cancer. So the vaccines, as we all know, they work by activating the antigen presenting uh, uh, dendritic cells, which in turn uh, process the antigen and present it to the T cells. These T cells actually then become cytotoxic to the cells which contain these antigens and then they hence attack uh, the tumor cells and uh, destroy the tumor. That is the uh, mechanism of action of these vaccines. This works both in, in a, equally effectively as in uh, infections. But this is a theoretical uh, uh, this thing, approach, whereas practically when we look at it, not many vaccines have proven to be quite effective. The only uh, agent that has shown adequate or, or reasonable efficacy is Cipulicity. T. Then the next approach is immune checkpoint inhibition, where the immune cell is presented with tu uh, tumor antigens uh, at various checkpoints like PDL1, then CTLAs. These are checkpoints for uh, tumor cell inhibition. So these are presented to the immune cells and then they host an immune response to attack the tumors. So there are several vaccines which are uh, in the investigational stage. So vaccines, as we all know, they elicit an immune response, immune activation against uh, specific antigens. The antigens that are targeted in prostate cancer are PSA, PSMA, prostatic acid phosphatase, then prostate stem cell antigen, and several others. But most important are these agents, these antigens. So we have several vaccines that are being developed. Uh, the cell-based vaccines are the most commonly uh, researched uh, vaccines. These contain autologous tumor cells and uh, several agents have been uh, developed. Uh, we have GVAX, GVAX with chemo in several studies. Then as I mentioned, Cipulucil 
T is the only vaccine related agent which has uh, provided significantly improved overall survival. So, uh, sepulocell T is an agent which is uh, developed by stimulating the mononuclear cells by a combination of proteins including uh, GM-CSF and prostatic acid phosphatase. When such uh, uh, these cells are stimulated by these agents, sepulocell T is developed and it is known to attack the prostate cancer uh, uh, microenvironment much better. There is a, a trial that is going on, uh, which was concluded recently, a viable trial, because the endpoint was not reached and no difference in overall survival was uh, shown. So this included immunotherapy with docetaxel chemotherapy, but further studies are ongoing to uh, evaluate this further. So uh, I've enumerated a few active trials which are examining the vaccination strategies in advanced prostate cancer. So most of them are, as you can see here, most of them are uh, for uh, metastatic uh, CRPC uh, subgroups. So we have several agents like uh, some vaccines, then other immunotherapeutic agents like pembrolizumab, then semiplimab. So I, I, I'll... Uh, enumerate a few of them later in detail. So then we, after vaccines, we come to the role of checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, checkpoint inhibitors, uh, some of them have shown impressive and durable responses with proper biomarker selections. So uh, biomarker selection is very important here. That's why uh, the next topic is uh, uh, being presented by my colleague, Dr. Vishal, who will actually uh, 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 he, he will uh, tell you about the importance of biomarkers in uh, prostate cancer. Uh, we have uh, anti-CTLA-4 antibodies and PDL1 inhibitors, which are the most uh, common and important checkpoint inhibitors that are in the research uh, trials. So anti-CTLA-4 antibodies are imiplimab, sorry, uh, nipilimumab and uh, nivolumab. So, in fact, uh, there is a trial which has shown very favorable response, which has been published in the uh, Journal of Clinical Oncology, which combined docetaxel with ipilimumab uh, uh, immunotherapy. And uh, this has shown a favorable response in nearly 25 to 30% of the subjects that are treated in this particular uh, trial. Then we have uh, PDL1 inhibitors. Several agents uh, are available. Uh, nivolumab is one, pembrolizumab, and uh, the other agent is atezolizumab. This is a PDL1 antibody. So these are uh, uh, being used in ongoing trials. Uh, pembrolizumab, in particular, has shown uh, uh, promising results in several trials. Uh, a keynote uh, 28 trial has shown an uh, excellent response where uh, there was a positive PDL1 expression in more than 1% of uh, tumor or stromal cells. In tumors which did not have, which did not meet this criteria of uh, more than 1% uh, expression, the results of pembrolizumab use was very disappointing. So uh, patient selection is uh, very important here. And in another trial, Keynote 199, a good response was seen with uh, this pembrolizumab in uh, bone predominant disease and in combination with docetaxel. And of course, better response was also noted in BRCA1 or 2 uh, mutations or ATM alterations. And uh, use of uh, atezolizumab, which is a PDL1 antibody, also showed uh, improved efficacy in uh, tumors with microsatellite instability. So based on uh, these preliminary results, uh, several combination therapies have been tried, especially with uh, most of them, including PDL1 inhibitors. So a combination of PDL1 inhibitors with the anti-CTLA4 antibodies has been tried. Uh, so one trial, impact trial, has shown uh, using a combination of durvalumab and tremelumab. And there's another uh, a, a combination that is ipilimumab and nivolumab has shown a 33% uh, PSA free, uh, uh, progression free survival in this uh, subgroup of uh, subjects. Uh, then 
PDL1 antibodies with androgen receptor uh, targeting agents, uh, mainly enzalutamide, has been tried. The rationale for combination of uh, this, these agents, uh, enzalutamide and pembrolizumab, is that enzalutamide may enhance interferon gamma signaling, thereby sensitizing tumor cells to immune mediated killing. One. Then PDL1 inhibitors work better after sensitization. In fact, an upregulation has been noted. Uh, after treatment with enzalutamide in these tumors. So in one of the trials, a combination of pembrolizumab with enzalutamide has shown a more than 50% reduction in PSA in 25% of the patients uh, in, in the trial. Uh, combination of PD-L1 uh, inhibitors and chemotherapy has also been tried in uh, trials. The rationale is that chemotherapy leads to cytotoxic cell death and this cell death leads to antigen release and this in turn leads to immune stimulation with uh, pdl1 upregulation so when there is pdl1 upregulation when these inhibitors are used the uh, response is expected to be better so there is one checkmate 9 kd trial where nivolumab has been used with docetaxel has shown uh, more than 50% PSA reduction and an overall response rate in 40% of patients and 46% respectively. Uh, another approach is PDL1 inhibition with PARP inhibitors. PARP uh, uh, inhibitors are those uh, Olaparib and Rucaparib, which are uh, poly ADP <coughs> deoxyribose uh, phosphatase inhibitors. So, PARP inhibition has seen to enhance response to checkpoint inhibitors by several mechanisms. One of them is uh, potentiating DNA damage, inducing defective DNA repair in tumors, and causing immunologically relevant mutations. When all these changes occur due to usage of PARP inhibitors, PDL1 inhibitors are expected to work better in this kind of tumor microenvironment. So, there is an ongoing trial uh, with uh, pembrolizumab and Olaparib. The results are yet to be published. Uh, Neolumab and Rucaparib results, prelimin preliminary results have been uh, published, which have confirmed an overall response rate and a PSA reduction of more than 50% from the baseline in about 41% of the subjects. Another approach is PDO-L1 inhibitors and tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Use of TKIs is known to enhance response to checkpoint inhibitors. There is a phase three contact uh, zero two trial that is going on uh, with the use, usage of atezolizumab and cabozantinib. So this has shown an 84 to 85 percent, uh, 88 percent control rate, uh, and this is still preliminary and ongoing trials. Final results are again yet to be published. Uh, there are ongoing trials of multikinase inhibitor le uh, levonatinib and pembrolizumab use. The results again are awaited. So these are the uh, a few ongoing trials uh, with uh, various uh, immunotherapeutic agents. Uh, so uh, the results are expected uh, to be out in the next one decade. Uh, I, I'm uh, sorry for the quality of the slides, but uh, the uh, summary of these slides show that uh, mainly immunotherapeutic agents, pembrolizumab, uh, used with other agents like chemotherapeutic agents, uh, then enzalutamide have shown promising results in MCRPC patients in, uh, in the preliminary uh, uh, trials. So finally, I will just uh, give you a conceptual framework of treatment in advanced prostate cancer. Prostate cancer can be, uh, advanced prostate cancer can be uh, classified into castrate naive and castrate resistant uh, prostate cancer and it can be non-metastatic or metastatic. So in non-metastatic castrate naive, the treatment, predominant treatment is androgen deprivation therapy and when it progresses to castrate resistant uh, uh, prostate cancer, then further uh, lines of treatment like uh, first line, second line and third line treatments are used. For uh, uh, M1 castrate naive, that is uh, metastatic castration naive uh, tumors, the predominant treatment is androgen deprivation therapy with docetaxel. 
it can be monotherapy androgen deprivation therapy or along with chemotherapy including docetaxel uh, this is an uh, this is published in uh, an expert consensus conference and majority of the experts they actually prefer uh, in high volume disease they prefer combining docetaxel with uh, adt whereas in uh, low volume uh, disease they prefer monotherapy with adt or uh, docetaxel for non metastatic uh, crpc as i mentioned it is a unique uh, therapeutic challenge uh, there is no treatment option with proven survival, survival benefit in this subgroup of patients and uh, these patients are recommended to uh, enroll themselves in clinical trials and most of the treatments are investigational in this subgroup so uh, in this group experts uh, agree that endocrine manipulation has no survival uh, benefit and uh, most of them they actually ask the subjects to go for uh, active surveillance and abstain from any treatment uh, and for uh, metastatic uh, crpc the first line treatment for asymptomatic and symptomatic have been uh, recommended in uh, with uh, after prospective phase 3 trials abiraterone uh, is recommended for low volume tumors without visceral uh, uh, metastasis abiraterone followed by enzalutamide and then uh, docetaxel is the first line therapy and cipuloxel t can be used with uh, uh, patients in patients with low volume tumors whereas for symptomatic uh, patients docetaxel is the first uh, choice treatment and radium 223 has also been tried for metastatic crpc the second line treatments are abiraterone uh, cabazitaxel uh, chemotherapy then enzalutamide and uh, radium 223 and uh, there are, there have been no prospective phase 3 trials for second line after abiraterone enzalutamide but some agents again which can be continued are abiraterone cabazitaxel docetaxel and enzalutamide for the third line therapy for metastatic crpc there are no prospective uh, phase 3 trials but options for patients with good performance uh, status are again the continuing the same agents abiraterone cabazitaxel that is why ongoing trials in immunotherapy may come up with uh, uh, several answers to all these questions and th they might throw options for treatment open to us in the next one decade so to conclude my talk uh, there are a multitude of options for uh, treatment of advanced prostate cancer uh, it depends on this uh, this thing whether they are hormone naive or hormone uh, uh, resistant uh, castrate resistant whether they are metastatic or non metastatic of course i should reiterate here that ra radiation therapy forms an integral part of uh, treatment of locally advanced disease especially in uh, post uh, radical prostatectomy local recurrences androgen deprivation therapy alone or in combination with with chemotherapy is still the most commonly used treatment options for advanced prostate cancer treatment whereas recent advances in immunotherapy is showing promising results uh, the immunotherapeutic agents used are checkpoint inhibitors then uh, park inhibitors psma radio ligand therapy using actinium lutetium these are em emerging as new modalities for management with reliable response rates i once again uh, thank uh, you all for patient participation and thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to talk thank you very much thank you so much sir for your wonderful presentations on targeted therapy and systemic therapy for the management of high risk prostate cancer it was indeed a wonderful presentation now i'll request dr vishal to kindly take over the stage and express his views on role of biomarkers in treatment and management of prostate cancer dr vishal if you are there and by the time i request all the audience those who have any questions please type in the q and a box and those who have any comments to kindly keep uh, kindly keep typing in the chat section we have received uh, certain wonderful comments 
like it was a very wonderful presentation a wonderful session thank you so right. much for your comments yeah dr vishal you could take over the stage yes thank you hi good evening everyone uh, dr vishal ratkal here and i was just practicing in bangalore uh, thank you for this opportunity for to me to speak on you words on role of biomarkers in treatment of advanced carcinoma prostate uh as already mentioned by dr giridhar that prostate cancer is the second leading cause of death among men especially in the western world and we are seeing rising numbers in india as well and there are so many treatment options available as is already enumerated so in the maze of all these treatment options the question is like which treatment for whom who will respond to what treatment do we try everything in a particular individual or do we go in a sequential way or is there a particular uh, sorry uh, is my video on can you see me yes sir yes yeah, now we can you. see thank so you, uh, do we do it in a sequential way do we uh, is there a particular sequence to follow or which particular uh, agent is useful to whom so how do you answer that question uh, so it's been it's something which has I mean, as and when the drugs have been available, as and when uh, more research has happened, that's one of the things which has baffled the clinicians. I mean, drugs manufacturing, I mean, the drug research, manufacturing, everything is something which happens behind the scenes. But when we are in front of the patient, when the patient asks us, like, will I respond to this particular treatment? And most of these are, uh, mind you, expensive treatments, at least when they came in initially. And then later, as and when it, can, it became more generally available, they become... More economical, but still, yes, some are quite expensive. Uh, if you like, for instance, take enzalutamide treatment, which is like the uh, from the original manufacturer, the monthly treatment runs into three and a half, four lakh rupees per month. So the question we come across as clinicians is, yes, fine, doc, we will start on this treatment, but am I a candidate for this treatment? And till date, if you ask me honestly, we are still shooting in the dark. You know, we start and we then hope that there is a response, and then. Uh, if he doesn't respond, then we go on to the next one. So, bio, these biomarkers, the role of biomarkers actually come in this scenario. And they can be useful in predicting whether a patient will respond to a particular treatment option and may also help us in avoiding therapies which, are, which may not be useful to him. But what it will not predict is whether he will respond, what will be the treatment response. Okay, so we can, based on the biomarkers, we can decide, okay, this particular patient may respond to this particular treatment, but how well or how badly he will respond, we don't know. Okay, so uh, in order to obtain the best clinical outcomes, they need to be treated with therapies that are most likely to benefit them and to avoid toxic therapies. And predictive biomarkers allow for the selection of the therapies which are most likely to be benefit uh, and uh, which based on our treatment decisions. And biomarkers which are uh, available are for molecular sequencing, circulating tumor DNA, circulating tumor cell enumeration, and uh, androgen receptor characteristic, which I'll be enumerating in the coming slides. The definition of a biomarker... Really sorry to disturb you, sir. Yes. Sir, are you presenting the screen? Yes. Uh, is... So we can't see the screen. Okay. One minute. Okay, I'll, I'm, I'm starting to share the screen now. Can you see now? Yes, sir. Good yeah, see you. That's great. Thank you, sir. So, uh, definition of biomarkers as per uh, the NCI, National Cancer, Cancer Institute of USA, is it defines a biomarker as a biological molecule found in blood of other body fluids or tissues, maybe a prosthetic biopsy tissue or CSF or urine uh, or the blood that is a sign of normal or abnormal process or of a condition or disease. A biomarker may be used to see how well the body responds to a treatment for a disease or condition. This is the definition of which the NCI has proposed for a biomarker. And with the advent of personalized medicine and genomic sequencing in the management of prostate cancer, targetable molecular alterations were identified, as well as mechanisms of resistance can be used to determine which available treatment is likely to be most clinically advantageous to a patient. Now, what, where did uh, the biomarkers actually come in? Why biomarkers? 
So there is a molecular basis for whatever treatment we have heard over the last half an hour with uh, by Dr. Giridhar. And most of the molecular treatment is like centered around this androgen receptor. So this androgen receptor is expressed in the luminal prostate uh, cells and it has three major domains. Uh, one is a DNA binding domain, another one is a nucleotide uh, N-terminal binding domain and a ligand binding domain. And this AR gene is located in X chromosome Q11-12. And it, uh, the uh, uh, receptor is manufactured or like processed uh, in the nucleus and then it is transported into the luminal epithelium. And from there, the dry hydrotestosterone at, with, after conversion to test, I mean, testosterone, after conversion to DHT to, by the action of DHEA acts on this uh, uh, receptor and causes proliferation of these cells. So, uh, these are all the mechanisms which Dr. Giridhar has enumerated already. How, uh, what are the possible things which go wrong and what are the uh, treatment options available for us based on these molecular mechanisms? These are the treat therapeutic agents which is already enumerated. Uh, the RCs are the abiratron and enzalutamide, chemotherapy, docetaxel, cabocetaxel, carboplatin, radiophemistical therapy, radium and lutetium, targeted therapy, oraperib, rutcaparib, ipatacerib, ipatacerib, and immunotherapy is pembrolizumab. The biomarkers in the management of prostate cancer based on treatment strategy uh, for the androgen deprivation therapy, the most commonly used biomarker is uh, serum PSA. This is the most commonly used and most widely available. There are certain uh, characteristics of P serum PSA, which I'll be enumerating in, in the next few slides. And then the next most common is serum testosterone. Uh, three hydroxysteroid beta one hydrogenase genotype is another one. These are all both predictive and prognostic. Uh, the RCs, the, the androgen receptor signaling inhibitors, the biomarkers are neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. So biomarkers are classified as either being predictive or prognostic. So some are both predictive and prognostic, where few are predictive only and some are only prognostic. A serum testosterone is predictive, CTC's enumeration is prognostic, AR splice variant 7, ARV7 is predictive, CTC or tumor, tumor DNA is predictive. Now, which biomarker for which treatment? Uh, this table beautifully enumerates all that. Uh, ARV is ERG, DNA repair, and SLFN, uh, the uh, Schlafen expression protein is for chemotherapy. Uh, radiopharmaceutical therapy, uh, the total alkaline phosphatase, bone scan index, BM, uh, bone metabolic markers, and PSM expression, and targeted therapy, HRR mutations and P10 loss, immunotherapy, MSI and DMMR, HRR mutations, the tumor mutation burden, which Sir already explained, and PDLN expression. So, coming to the most widely used biomarker, the most commonly used and most well understood, at least till date, has been the PSA. The PSA, uh, the, well, the parameters which have been studied are the PSA nadir and the PSA kinetics. The retrospective review of, of patients receiving primary ADT for metastatic prostate cancer by Sasaki et al. Indicated that a lower PSNRDIR and with ADT and a longer time to PSNRDIR, which is more than nine months, was associated with improved overall survival in prostate cancers with bony metastasis. In a, another SWOP trial uh, suggested that a PSA level after seven months after uh, initiating uh, ADT can be used as a predictor of survival, overall survival, and achieving a PSA of uh, four nanogram per ml or less than less after seven months of ADT may be a predictor of risk of death in metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer, especially with patients with PS of 0.2 nanogram per ml or less having the greatest survival advantage. In non-metastatic CRPC, a PSA doubling time of greater than 10 months uh, indicates a relatively indolent course, whereas a PSA doubling time of less than 10 months is at high risk for development of metastasis. So this clinical biomarker of PSA doubling time is currently employed to select patients with non-metastatic CRPC for additional therapy with a potent anti-androgen such as enzalutamide, aflutamide, or dorlutamide. So this kind of answers the question to us, who are the patients who will benefit from enzalutamide or one of their uh, like uh, similar agents? The next most commonly used uh, biomarker is the baseline serum testosterone. 
and higher serum testosterone levels prior to EDT initiation, MCR, PCR associated with increased survival. Uh, a study by Chodak et al. retrospective study found out that a two-year survival rate of 67% for men with serum testosterone levels of 8.6 nanomole per liter and above versus 30% in testosterone below 8.6 nanomole per liter. So higher the testosterone, greater is the survival at two years and five years. So it logically follows that prostate cancers are progressing despite lower serum testosterone have already adapted in part to a low testosterone state and therefore be less sensitive to further androgen deprivation. So these are patients who will not respond to hormone manipulation and they will need to have a, a different uh, agent like a immunotherapy or a chemotherapy. Uh, one of these agents will have to be tried on them. Next is the HSD3 beta 1 genotype. It may serve as a prognostic marker for patients with uh, metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancers with low volume disease and as a predictive marker for response to ADT in this population. But it is not a, a predictive marker for treatment benefit with docetaxel. So if the patient is already on docetaxel or if you plan to put the patient on docetaxel, 3 beta HSD1 has no role. A high volume disease. Uh, versus low volume disease. In patients with low volume disease, freedom from CRPC at two years was significantly lower in patients with adrenal permissive genotype. There are two types of uh, HSD3. There are two variants. One is adrenal permissive and another is adrenal restrictive. And higher uh, efficacy or it is better uh, tre treatment response is seen in adrenal permissive types. So similarly, OSFIS was worse in those with HSDB3.31 with a adrenal permissive. But this is all in low volume disease in patients with high volume disease, which is defined as either a visceral lesion or more than four uh, skeletal lesions. There is no role of HSD3 beta 1. Uh, the next one is a neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, NLR. It can be used as a prognostic factor in multiple solid malignancies, including prostate cancer. Uh, retrospective study by Ku et al. noted that a pre treatment cutoff of 2.5 in patients who had received docetaxel before or after air directed therapy uh, had greater survival and uh, lower two years cancer specific survival and one year radiographic progression of survival compared to those with the NLR below 2.5. So potential for use uh, of NLR in guiding the sequence of therapy in CRPC patients where the NLR is below 2.5 may have, may have roles in both as prognostic and predictive biomarker that need to be investigated further. A circulating tumor cell enumeration. Uh, this is an FDA approved uh, biomarker, emerging biomarker, which has been patented by uh, Janssen Diagnostic, Janssen Diagnostics based in the USA. In a retrospective study by Mayen et al, who studied peripheral blood from the prostate cancer patients versus controls using an RT-PCR technique uh, targeting the PSA mRNA. At follow-up of four to 49 months, the detection of CTCs was shown to be associated with increased risk of developing metastasis and relapse. And uh, similarly, a study by Kantoff et al. with the detection of CTCs using RT-PCR for PSA was shown to predict poorer survival with CRPC with 13 months for detectable versus 18 months for non-detectable. A study by DeBono et al. in MCRP patients with, with disease progression and who we're starting a new treatment, a higher or unfavorable CTC count, which is five or greater per 7.5 ml, both pre-treatment and post-treatment. That is two to five weeks after initiating treatment predicted a shorter overall survival compared to a lower or favorable CTC count. So lower CTC count is the treatment response is better. The overall survival is better and patients tend to do well with the lower CTC count. So patients pre-treatment and post-treatment, the CTC is followed up and uh, based on the CTC, one can have an idea about how well they do. The next com most common and uh, one is the to total alkaline phosphatase, especially in patients receiving radium-223. Uh, normal pretreatment total alkaline phosphatase is associated with longer overall survival than with an elevated total alkaline phosphatase. And a reduction of 10% or greater in elevated baseline total alkaline phosphatase at four weeks or beyond from treatment is also associated with over improved overall survival. Clinical predictive biomarkers, these are mostly molecular agents, uh, genetic, like molecular proteins. Uh, AR splice variant 7, patients with ARV7 mRNA detected in CTCs derive greater survival benefit. 
both in terms of overs and progression free survival with vaccine therapy compared to those with abiratron or enzalutamide. So these are the patients with ARV7 are patients for vaccine therapy. A study by Tagawa et al. found that absence of ARV7 truncated forms or an uh, exon skipping ARV7 variant is associated with superior progression free survival in patients with MCRPC when treated with the taxins, either cabazitaxel or docetaxel. The circulating free DNA or circulating tumor DNA, these are small nuclear acid fragments present in the bloodstream secondary to either apoptosis and necrosis of the prim uh, primary tumor cells or the release of intact tumor cells in the bloodstream that subsequently undergo lysis. Uh, Cell-free DNA, uh, circulating cell-free DNA carries tumor-related genetic and epigenetic changes that have a role in cancer progression and treatment resistance. Uh, there is one FDA-approved next-generation uh, next sequence-based foundation on liquid CDX test that uses a cell-free DNA isolated from plasma of MCRPC patients to identify mutations of the BRCA1, BRCA2, and ADM genes. Now, in study by Azad et al. Uh, detected an AR gene aberration that confer resistance to enzalutamide on aberatron, including AR amplification and AR exon 8 mutations in cell-free DNA. And hence, these patients should not receive either enzalutamide or abiteron. So, presence of cell-free DNA, again, in a study by Wyatt et al. also noted worse progression to survival if there was an AR amplification, two or more mutations in the AR gene and a loss of retinoblastoma 1 gene, which is seen. So that the data obtained thus far, however, do not suggest a clinical predictive biomarker role for cell-free DNA or a first line for first-line uh, ARSIs. A serum testosterone levels, uh, androgen receptor targeted therapy, pre-treatment serum testosterone levels have potentially a predictive role. In a study by Hashimoto et al., patients with testosterone levels between 5 and 50 had longer PSA PA, uh, progression phase survival than those with levels below 5 nanogram per DL. And for, for patients with testosterone below 5 nanogram per DL, the rate of PSA response was higher in patients treated with abiratron compared to enzalutamide. Uh, so this has a clinical relevance. So you uh, do a testosterone, if it is less than 5, better to start him on abiratron than, uh, than starting him on enzalutamide. In a similar study by Shiota M. et al., in patients on enzalutamide, superior progression to survival when pre-treatment serum testosterone levels were more than 0.05 nanogram per ml, while no difference in patients on abiratron. So, conversely, for metastatic CRP patients treated with uh, docetaxel, PFS was higher in patients with testosterone levels above 0.05 nanogram per ml. Hence, pre-treatment serum testosterone levels may have productive value in the selection of AR-targeted therapy versus chemotherapy in patients with metastatic CRPC. A tumor mutational burden, uh, which was pointed out by Dr. Girida that it is low in terms in case of CA prostate, uh, and PDL and ex expression. The phase two checkmate study, which was already enumerated, study evaluated a nivolumab ipilimab combination in metastatic CRPC and PDL on greater or equal to 1%. HRR deficiency, mutations in DNA damage repair genes, and high TMP may all predict response to immune checkpoint, checkpoint inhibitors in metastatic CRPC. Uh, this is a picture diagram of uh, the various mutations, mismatch repair genes, uh, uh, DNA mismatch repair genes, and uh, ADP uh, PARP inhibitors and CDK12 activation, and which one is useful in, uh, in how immune, for where is immunotherapy useful, where is a PARP inhibitor useful, and where are immune checkpoint inhibitors useful. A microsatellite instability and uh, uh, DNA mismatch repair deficiency, tumors with these DMMR have no high, have high number of somatic mutations, including repetitive DNA sequences called microsatellites, resulting in instability. These are called MSIH. Genes involved are MLH, MSH26, MSH6, and PMS2. Uh, DNA mismatch repair response uh, repair uh, presence has high number of infiltrating lymphocytes and PDL and expression on cells. Hence, DMR, uh, DMMR, and MSIH can have robust anti tumor activity. So, MSIH can serve as a biomarker for PDO and blockade. Uh, pembrolizumab may be used in M metastatic CRPC patients with uh, DMMR uh, MSIH combination and the prevalence of DMMR in metastatic CRPC is 2 to 5 percent. Uh, these are all like the clinically relevant biomarkers. Now uh, I'll enumerate a few experimental biomarkers which are not in clinical use but uh, may see uh, clinical relevance in the next 5 to 10 years. 
uh, ERG and SOX9 E26 transforming specific protein related gene is an overexpressed oncogene in prostate cancer and ERG fusion status may be a biomarker of docetaxel resistance. So anybody with a ERG fusion status will not be a candidate for docetaxel. A tempres 2 uh, ERG expression correlated with a lower PSA progression to survival, clinical or radiologic PFS and OR, OS in patients treated with docetaxel. Uh, Schlafman uh, 11 expression DNA, DNA RNA helicase expression may have a role in selecting patients who may benefit from platinum based chemotherapy. A bone scan indexed prognostic indicator of uh, overall survival. A retrospective study by Postball et al. suggested that patients, uh, metastatic CRPC patients with a lower bone scan index had better overall survival compared to higher bone scan index. There are a few bone metabolic markers which are being studied uh, as both predictive and prognostic indicators in MCRPC with bone metastasis. Markers of bone resorption include n telopeptide and pyridinolone, and markers of bone formation including C, terminal of type 1 collagen peptide, and bone-specific alkaline phosphatase. In SWOG, zero, in, uh, SWOG 0421 trial, where atrocyanin, uh, which is an endothelin antagonist and a bone targeting agent, uh, was combined with docetaxel, and there were two different cohorts. Lara et al. studied and found elevated levels at baseline were associated with poor over survival. Uh, while the serial decrease in levels of urine, n telopeptide and serum BAP suggested better OS. So bone metabolic uh, markers may have a predictive role in determining which patients may benefit from bone targeted therapies. PSMA expression, which is mostly a diagnostic modality right now, may have therapeutic uh, implications in the near future. With a higher expression is associated with a more aggressive tumor, particularly in CRPC, a 68 gallium PSMA 11 PET CT may allow that a selection of patients expound, expected to respond best to lutetium 177 PSMA radionuclide therapy in the future. It's coming to the P10 loss. Uh, there is a P10 PI3 AKT pathway which occurs in more than 50% patients of metastatic CRPC patients, resulting in PI3 AKT pathway activation, resulting in tumor growth and proliferation. A loss of P10 has been associated with shorter time on AR therapy inhibitors treatment potentially due to reciprocal negative feedback of the PI3K and AR signaling pathways. And drugs that target AK, AKT or PI3K inhibitors are currently being tested in clinical trials as monotherapy for AKT mutated tumors or in combination with ARPIs. A P10 loss inactivation is associated with CRPC, PS, prostate cancer specific mortality, and metastasis. P10 loss is associated with reduced response to AR targeted agents such as abiraterone. And ipatacerative is an investigational agent that is being developed for prostate cancer, likely for a biomarker selected population patient, especially with P10 loss. A P10 loss may be predicted, may predict improved clinical outcomes with ipatacerative or abiraterone combination in metastatic CRPC patients. So I would like to conclude by saying that the management of advanced prostate cancer requires individualized treatment paradigms and sequences based upon the patient's clinical status disease characteristics, genomics, and available biomarkers. In order to maximize the outcome for patients, they need to be treated early with therapies with the highest chance for response and benefit. And patients also need to avoid, uh, avoid trials of ineffective therapies given the multiple other treatment agents available. While some predictive biomarkers, especially for tumor genomics for targeted therapy and ARV7 status for chemotherapy are already deployed in the clinic, further development is required to truly guide therapy selection through the disease course. Thank you so much for this opportunity for share, uh, providing me a platform to share my thoughts on uh, the role of biomarkers in this. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your wonderful presentations related to the role of biomarkers in the treatment and management of prostate cancer. Now I'll request both the speakers for the Q&A session. Uh, just in case if any audience uh, have any questions, I'll request them to kindly type in the Q&A box or in the chat section. Uh, so, sir, there are a few questions which have been received by us. Uh, like Dr. Gidhar, you were uh, talking about the androgen-deprived therapy. Uh, what is an approach towards uh, the treatment and uh, can you please elaborate more about it? Uh, androgen deprivation uh, therapy, <clears throat> am I audible? Yes, sir, you're audible. Yeah. So, the androgen deprivation therapy is the cornerstone of treatment uh, is the first line of treatment for uh, prostate cancer, which are which is host, uh, hormone sensitive. It is called hormone naive prostate cancer, and uh, 
mainly metastatic. Okay. So uh, for localized prostate cancer, local therapy is the best. So if the prostate cancer is localized to the prostatic bed, radical prostatectomy followed by radiotherapy, depending on the risk status, risk profile is uh, recommended. We all know that it is localized prostate cancer. Local therapy is what is recommended. But once the disease spreads, once it becomes metastatic, then we need to go for systemic therapy. So systemic therapy is based on two uh, 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 approaches. One is whether the tumor is hormone naive, that is whether it is sensitive to hormones or uh, castrate resistant, or, which means that it is resistant to hormonal therapy, which has escaped hormonal uh, 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 treatment. So uh, androgen deprivation therapy is the first choice treatment for hormone naive uh, metastatic prostate cancer. <laughs> That is the first pa part of it. And uh, hormone uh, androgen deprivation has several uh, limbs in itself. One is that the first line ADT, and then there are second line ADTs are also available. So second line ADTs are used, uh, especially abiraterone and enzalutamide. These are second line uh, agents, which are used when the first line treatment uh, is uh, when, when the disease grows beyond the first line, we have uh, given first line treatment, there is response and slowly uh, the uh, response wanes off and the patient becomes castrate resistant. So, the, so which means the PSA starts going up again. So any metastatic prostate cancer is uh, actually monitored by PSA levels. So when the PS, uh, when we provide the first line androgen deprivation therapy, we expect the PSA levels to drop to nadir levels. So uh, sometimes it may be undetectable. Uh, at times it will be very low but detectable. In these cases, we continue androgen deprivation till the PSA levels start rising. So when the PSA levels start rising, then it is called a castrate resistant uh, prostate cancer. In these patients we go for second line ADT. So the first line ADT is for hormone name and second line, third line agents are for hormone resistant or castrate resistant prostate cancer. Thank you so much, sir. I would I'd like to add one more thing yeah, when sure, you're doing, sir. like as sir said, uh, you have to monitor the PSA levels. Uh, simultaneously, you also have to look at the serum testosterone level as well. So it has to be less than 10 nanogram per day, uh, 20, I think, sir. 20, right? 20. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah um, it has to be less than uh, several levels. 50 yes. nanogram is yeah. uh, in so some studies. It is, it is a combination of serum PSA and serum testosterone to call it a CRPC. Yes, sir, correct. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, so, Dr. Vishal, my question towards you is uh, how can we know that immunotherapy is useful? What are the associated risks and uh, what are the benefits of immunotherapy in prostate cancer? Uh, immunotherapy is not very widely practiced uh, to be able to like under it's like the topic in itself. How do we know it is useful? Yeah, uh, the clinical biomarkers which we have right now are serum PSA and testosterone itself. So any rising serum PSA even after instituting immunotherapy, no response noted means that's the failure of treatment. Uh, other way, the uh, side effects of immunotherapy are not as much as the other uh, hormonal agents like hot flashes or weight loss or loss of appetite. So immunotherapy is fairly well tolerated, but then again, it is not a very widely used clinical uh, agent. So the experience on most general neurologists or even uro-oncologists is limited. It's, it's mostly medical oncologists. Once we I realize that he, is, he may be a candidate for immunotherapy, we usually uh, refer for, to a medical oncologist to start on immunotherapy. Yeah, uh, I would like to add a small point here. Immunotherapy has been developed over the last uh, one to one and a half decades, 10 to 15 years only. Before that, there was no immunotherapeutic options for prostate cancer. So because of this, uh, such a short duration of uh, 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 this thing availability, a lot of studies are still going on. So we don't have definitive answers yet about the efficacy of immunotherapy. So probably in the years to come, we may get uh, more information about it and probably we'll be able to answer this particular question better. Definitely, sir. 
Uh, so, sir, what could be the recent advances towards the management of prostate cancer that are being used uh, at your center or uh, what are that, that are commonly accepted? Uh, well, actually, uh, I, I'll answer part of this question and I would request Dr. Vishal to answer this also. Uh, basically, the center where I work, uh, we are not practicing neuro-oncology extensively. So we are not uh, uh, too much into these uh, immunotherapeutic agents. But uh, where what we practice uh, widely is mainly first-line androgen deprivation uh, with or without chemotherapy. That is the most commonly used. And when there is escape, in the sense when the uh, tumor becomes uh, castrate resistant, then we go on to the second-line uh, therapies. Uh, that is uh, enzalutamide and uh, cabazitaxel chemotherapy. The thing here is earlier, we used to use only LHRH agonists with uh, bicalutamide. That is the first generation uh, anti-androgen. That was the most uh, uh, popular uh, combination of complete androgen blockade that was being used. So luprolide with bicalutamide was the most common. And some, it is uh, the clinician's preference to either use gosarelin or triptorelin along with uh, anti-androgen. But uh, with time, uh, we have also started using this Degarelix, which is a, a GnRH antagonist. So we have another uh, uh, drug in the this thing in our armamentarium. So when the PSA levels are very high, with uh, a widespread metastasis, uh, GnRH antagonist uh, is, I mean, shown to give very good initial response. So one approach is that uh, we start off in these patients with GnRH antagonists, and later, once there is a favorable response, we switch over to the standard ADT, that is GnRH agonist and uh, uh, first generation uh, anti-androgen by calutamide. So when there is escape, when they stop responding over the next few years to this combination, then we proceed to enzalutamide. So, and the second approach is that along with the first line therapy, a lot of people also use abiraterone, which is an androgen uh, uh, receptor uh, blocker. Uh, so, abiraterone is used along with first line as well as second line therapies. I would also like uh, some inputs from Dr. Vishal. Yeah, sir has very nicely summarized it. That is like the gist of the treatment. Uh, what's one more thing that like which we were extensively practicing before, but which has kind of gone out of fashion now is the surgical castration. So if patients were, we, we weren't sure if the patient would be on follow-up or if there were economic constraints or something. So bilateral orchidectomy was uh, very extensively practiced and still a, still an option now, especially patients who are not willing to undergo this injections every month or once in three months, not willing for tablets. Surgical castration is still an option, one. Second thing is, as I rightly pointed out, uh, LHRH antagonists or GNHRH antagonists, they have their own uh, uh, advantages, especially that the response, initial response is wonderful. You give one injection and next 24 to 36 hours, you see uh, PSA dropping like uh, a, a really good response. Uh, in, there are a particular set of patients in whom we will continue LHRH antagonists and not switch over to agonists. These are patients with cardiac conditions because LHRH agonists, GNRH agonists or LHRH agonists are not very favorable for patients with cardiac conditions, especially uh, patients with uh, like, uh, low cardiac output or cardiac failure or uh, low cardiac reserve, right? So they, they are that particular set of patients who are more favorably treated with an LHRH antagonist. Also, as Sir said, the advantage of giving an antagonist or an agonist initially is there is something called as a player phenomenon. To circumvent this player phenomenon, what we do is generally start them on bicalutamide for a week, 10 days, and then after a week or 10 days, we we'll give them an agonist injection, be it uh, pamerlinin or gosarelin or lutralite, whatever. So with an antagonist, that is a digarelix, you don't need to do that. There is no player phenomenon or there are like very sparse literature or very, very, very sparse this one saying that, okay, an occasional patient may have a player phenomenon, but overall the impression is that antagonists don't have a player phenomenon. So and the rest of it, sir, has very nicely summarized it. I, uh, I think that's really well put. Thank you, sir.
Thank you, sir. So moving towards the last question. Uh, so, sir, what are the factors that affect your decision towards the management of prostate cancer? Uh, yeah, this is a question which uh, we can go on for debating for hours and hours. But Definitely. I'll put uh, my thoughts very briefly. Uh, first is the risk profile of the patient, of the disease, whether it's a low risk disease, intermediate risk disease, disease or high risk disease. Okay, that is one. Second thing is the uh, performance status of the patient. Whether the patient can tolerate any kind of therapy or whether there are some limitations. So based on these, uh, our treatment uh, selection is becomes quite simple. So if it is localized disease, uh, then of course, surgery uh, plus or minus radiotherapy is the standard choice. There is no doubt about it. And when it is not localized disease, not localized means when it is metastatic. When it is metastatic disease, uh, we have to consider whether it is hormone name or castrate resistant. So for hormone name, first option is androgen deprivation therapy. That is, as we discussed, LHRH agonists uh, with bicalutamide, then GnRH antagonists. These are first-line therapy. And then we keep them on these therapies as long as they respond. And if they progress towards castrate resistant uh, 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 stage, then we go on to uh, uh, the, the three lines of first-line therapy for uh, CRPC. That is, uh, these are... Uh, and, and uh, sorry, uh, chemotherapy, docetaxel chemotherapy along with ADT, followed by second line uh, uh, anti androgens, abiraterone and uh, uh, enzalutamide. Lot of people use uh, docetaxel chemotherapy with abiraterone. So that is the first line for uh, that is the first line for uh, uh, metastatic uh, CRPC and enzalutamide is the next line therapy. And then if there is no response to docetaxel, we shift to cabazitaxel. And then of course, other uh, therapies are uh, radi radium-223 or uh, lutetium-labeled uh, 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 PSMA ligand therapy. These are some options. Of course, most of the other immunotherapeutic options that I mentioned are still investigational and none of them are clinically recommended for uh, clinical use. Thank you, sir. So, uh, Dr. Vishal, what are the challenges that you face while the management of prostate cancer? Challenges is first, the first thing is to keep uh, updating ourselves on all the treatment options available, you know, as in like the, the scenario keeps changing so fast. Every other year, there is a new drug that is coming in and the data, I mean, yes, of course, they would have had them data of five, four years, five years, but then still as a clinician, you, you, you're not sure about whether that, how much of the data will apply to our Indian population because most of them are from the Western population. So what side effects they have described, uh, what side effects we may encounter, what exactly to counsel the patient. That's like, to just keep ourselves updated, like as I said, it's it's like of all the malignancies that we have seen, like bladder cancer, renal cancer, testicular tumors, penile cancers, whatever in urology, the fastest, you know, the scenario today will not be the same as from two years from now. We may be discussing an entirely different set of agents. If you were to hold the seminar two years from now, we may we may have another five or six set of agents which we'll be discussing, which will not even have been mentioned today, you know, something like that. That is the first thing. Second thing is, of course, the cost. New drugs, as I already mentioned once with benzalutamide, the new uh, Indian version, the, the Indian manufacturers have brought down the cost significantly. But if not for that, if only it were the Western manufacturers and original molecule, if you talk about, uh, costs are kind of prohibitive to most of our Indian population. You know, they run into lacks and most of them are not available or we have to wait for them. So costs and yes, uh, the whether this particular data is applicable to our population. Uh, third thing is, yeah, of course, the uh, patient, uh, the, the compliance of the treat, to the treatment, they take once and then they come back to you after six months or a year saying that I was all right all this year, all this time, so I did not want to take any more treatment. And then fortunate for the patient, 
if it is intermittent ADT, good. I mean, if the PSA has not spiked up, if there is a PSA spike, then we again have to search for uh, metastasis. So th these are all the challenges, like on a practical basis. Uh, yeah, like I think that's it. Thanks so much, sir. It was indeed an excellent uh, Q and A session with you both. But now, uh, with your due permission, I would now like to move towards the vote of thanks. Uh, uh, just before that, yeah, uh, I have sure, a small sir. point to make. There was one question in the uh, question answer which was typed actually. Yeah. Uh, uh, what is the best treatment for prostate cancer, chemotherapy or radiotherapy? So uh, this is a question which is uh, uh, like I, I would like to uh, mention that I have already answered it in the uh, yes, chat. Right. I have typed the answer, but chemotherapy is used in different uh, uh, situations and radiotherapy is to a large extent for localized prostate cancer, whereas uh, chemotherapy is for metastatic prostate cancer. So we cannot compare the two and say which is best. Radiotherapy gives best, uh, very good results for localized prostate cancer, whereas chemotherapy has shown very good results for metastatic prostate cancer. But comparing the two is not possible. Thank you, sir, for enlightening those words. Uh, with this, I would proceed with the vote of thanks. With gratitude and immense pleasure, Medical Learning Hub would like to thank Dr. Gidhar Venkatesh and Dr. Vishal Ratkal for, uh, for, sharing, uh, for sparing their time and uh, sharing their valuable opinions towards the topic of recent advancements in management of high-risk prostate cancer, targeted therapy, systemic therapy, and biomarkers to guide the treatment decisions. I would like to thank Kaveri Hospital for co-hosting this uh, event with us and also Bristol Myers Pip and Becca for supporting us throughout this webinar. We really are in a dire need to spread the awareness among the community towards the management of prostate cancer as well as towards taking uh, self-care towards uh, the cancer management. We thank all the participants for being with us. And we also have upcoming CMEs related to breast oncology, tuberculosis, gynecology. I'll request all the participants uh, and as well as our speakers to kindly go through our website, www.medicallearninghub.com. And thank you all. And thank you, Dr. Gezer. And thank you, Dr. Vishal, for sparing your time with us. It's First, been really a pleasure. Uh, session. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, it's been a pleasure being part of this, uh, uh, this thing, session. I thank you all uh, very much for this uh, opportunity and patient hearing. Thank you, everyone. Happy festival time. Have a nice time. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank, thank you, you sir. Uh, thank you, I request thank you so all the audience uh, who are with us to kindly submit their post polls. Uh, by the time, I would like to take you towards the journey of Medical Learning Hub. Uh, dear speakers, if you want to stay with us, you can. It would really be an honor if you could take ahead our uh, journey. And also, uh, if you want to leave, uh, that is fine. Thank you.
thank you all for being with us and thank you for your excellent comments we have received all your comments uh, and it indeed 